photorealism is when you take a visual effect element like our CG actor here and make it fully realistic in the shot as if it existed in camera. Hitting that target is the sum of a bunch of smaller notes that come together to sell the whole. And that's what we're diving in today while using Nuke for what I think is the first time on our channel. We'll cover the best practices while shooting down to the little touches that take the final shot from good to great. Plus, meet our VFX wizard for today, Olaf. Hi, my name is Olaf Blumaris. I'm a filmmaker and visual effects artist with over 10 years experience. Okay. That's enough. Olaf will be guiding us through the node-based magic of Nuke, including diving into an incredible technique using crypto mats to completely change the look of your model without having to re-render. But we'll get to that later. As always, this is a zero budget shoot. We don't have money for cast, crew, or location. So Justin, Renee, Josh, and I found this cool area in a muddy underpass. It had an interesting look with decent light and way too many spiders. The mud looked great on camera, but it was like wet clay and perpetually trying to steal our shoes. The most difficult aspect was the very bright background of direct sunlight versus the shadowy areas on our talent. But I'm shooting log on my Ronin 4D, which also let me keep everything very smooth. But that log is giving me a wide range. so. I know I'll be able to balance the shadow and highlight areas later in post. But once we picked out our line of action, we started to grab our shots and we were grabbing multiple passes for every shot the robot would be in, which I'll let Olaf explain. And Olaf is a VFX artist of 12 years and has worked on projects like Guardians of the Galaxy 3, Ironheart and Daredevil, and he's Canadian which means he's really nice and not afraid of bears. Thanks, Brian. So for this particular type of VFX shoot where you're replacing an actor with a visual effects character in post, there's a few things we need to do to get the desired result. First, shoot your scene like you would usually with both your actors. Not only will this help your actor as far as eye lines and reacting to something real, it'll help with performance reference for your animator and also help your camera op get a sense of timing and blocking for the next plate, your primary or main plate. This plate is your shot and typically the one that you have your VFX character added. Now, in bigger productions, your reference plate would most likely be your main plate and VFX artists would paint out the actor and create a clean plate. But for the sake of this shoot, a small team and a quick turnaround time, we opted to go this route. Lastly, we'd grab a clean plate. This isn't always required, but in cases where you find yourself needing it, they're essential. This just allows for raw information that you can use to paint out stuff like stands used to help with tracking difficult shots. Switch. Along with these multiple passes, I was also getting HDRs using my Insta360 cam and shots of our chrome ball, which is really just a cheap gazing globe since real chrome balls are too expensive. Olaf fully built his out with a handle and matted gray side, but I'm too lazy, so I just hold mine like it's a Palantiri from Lord of the Rings. <sighs> After being attacked by a gang of Studio Ghibli spiders and the earth stealing Josh's shoes, we were done with that location and happy to never go back. So I packaged up my flawlessly shot footage and sent it off to Olaf confident that I f***ing nailed it. He did not nail it. For this shot specifically, even with a rough survey track, we weren't able to get a solid camera saw for two main reasons. The background is very out of focus, but that's not even the main issue. The first issue lies in that this is all water, which not only moves, but is also a reflection of what's above. So the tracking program has no idea what's going on, and this takes up most of the frame too. The second issue is we only really have this small area of dirt to track, but that area doesn't last long, and when we get to the final framing of our composition, Justin's face takes up most of the frame, and now we're really left with pretty much nothing to track. So in short, the shot was untrackable and we needed to reshoot. So we went back and this time I shot in 6K with the intention of punching in quite a bit in post. This gives us all that extra overscan that Olaf can use to track the shot. I also placed a C-stand arm with green tape just to make sure we never have to come back here again. If you want to dig further into some of these ideas to make sure you're setting yourself up for success in post, check out this VFX 101 episode Olaf released recently. Link in the notes below. There's a lot of killer info in there. Like I said before, for this project, we used Nuke, and by we, I mean Olaf. But if you are into VFX in any way, I'm positive you already know what it is, and they are a partner on today's episode. But as always, if we don't love it, we don't talk about it. Nuke's most obvious advantage is its node-based workflow. For example, each of these backdrops can represent what would be a comp in After Effects, and more complex nodes like this could easily be another. So rather than having to dive into different pre-comps, you can see how they're all connected right here in one workspace. The node tree allows for multiple effects to build off and reference each other while all being laid out in front of you, like this quick luminance base key pulled from the plate to stencil the render before it gets merged over the original plate. Nuke also 
works really well with multi-channel EXRs or AOVs, reading a single file with multiple files contained inside, allowing for far cleaner file management and general organization in your comp as well as very precise control over the look of your render after it's been rendering for hours. Like changing the color of your sexy and deadly robot assassin without affecting things like specular lighting or reflections. But let's go back to that Chrome Ball and 360 HDR we shot. These work together to help both the 3D and comp artists match to the live action plate. Both the Chrome Ball and the 360 camera that captures the HDR are placed in your scene at the point where your future visual effects element will be placed in post. The Chrome Ball reference is shot through your master camera, while the 360 HDR is done after your last take and before you strike any lighting. The HDR is to help the 3D artists match the onset light for the VFX elements they're rendering. The Chrome Ball reference for the comp artist is used as reference for sharpness, highlights, shadows, contrast, and more. The Chrome Ball reference also allows the 3D artist to quickly orient the 360 HDR properly and adjust the exposure to best match what was exposed on set. It also acts as a safety net for the 3D artist to be able to rebuild the lighting of the scene in case you weren't able to get an actual HDR on set. Basically, if you have visual effects in your scene, you'll want to shoot a Chrome Ball and HDR pretty much always, which again, Olaf explains in more detail on his video, which you can find that link in the description. For this shot specifically, we have our robot walking up to Justin. But the robot is stepping on a dirt terrain, and if we left it as is, it seems like it's walking on top of the dirt and never really stepping into the dirt. Now, we could have spent the time to clean up our ground plane geometry and have it actually intersect with the render, but that would have clipped our geo at render and perhaps caused a few other issues we'd have to try and solve. Doing it here gives us full control and the most flexibility. To do this, we can use one of our passes in our render called a position pass. And what this pass specifically does is it uses color channels, much like a normal map in 3D textures, to tell us where in Z space or depth, that pixel would be in relation to the camera. A sort of faux 3D that works from only the original camera angle. So to best utilize it, you need the 3D camera you rendered with, which we have. Reading that camera in and using the position pass along with a node in Nuke called position of points, we can now see a 3D representation of our 2D image, which is pretty awesome and feels like some sort of futuristic 3D UI from Minority Reporter Foundation. And with this, we can see exactly where the feet land in 3D space. And using the 3D tools in Nuke, we can then place a card at each of those points of contact and mask out the foot as it makes contact with the ground. And since we have the 3D camera from our 3D scene, these cards stick in place, masking as the robot walks and creating the illusion that our robot is stepping into the dirt. But now we run into a new issue. Our cards are too perfect, and while there's a few ways we could achieve this next effect, what's great about Nuke is the community around it that have built endless supply of tools, or gizmos as they're often called, with the vast majority of them being free to download off of Nukepedia or GitHub. Take this one for example, Fractal Blur by Richard Fraser. All you need to do is copy this code, paste it into our script, Another great advantage to Nuke, this node will now add noise to the edge of any alpha and we can use that to break up the edges of these cards. The result is a small tweak that goes a long way to add realism to our composite. And speaking of adding realism, Nuke's lens distortion node helps us add yet another layer that brings our comp much closer to looking like it was shot on set and not rendered on a computer. With the lens distortion node, you're able to feed it a distortion grid that you would have shot during production and create a matching redistort node for your renders. But if you didn't, you're also able to use any footage with defined lines or edges. You simply match what should be perfectly straight lines and the node does the rest of the work. And if your render's at the edge of the frame, you simply make sure that you've added overscan into it so that when you distort it, there's information to do so. Studying your plate for camera nuances is very important when comping visual effects elements onto live action plates. Like this subtle green fringing happening here on our plate around the highlight areas of the background against any foreground. To recreate this on our render, we simply create an alpha based on the luminance of the background, then using the alpha of our rendered element to block out where it would be on the plate. Pipe that result through an edge detect node, which finds the edges of any alpha, give it a subtle blur, and then use that newly created edge mask to control a grade node, and boom green fringe applied. It's an effect that by itself seems incredibly subtle and almost unnoticeable, but it's the sum of all these small changes that help trick our brains into not even thinking about the fact that this robot was never there. And again, study the live action plate for all the things you should be adding to your visual effects. There's so much information there for free. You just have to look. 
Matching noise or grain, shadows and highlights along with your general color temperature of your footage is one of the most important things you can do when comping to make sure things look in place. And Nuke's tools help you do this easily. You can quickly gain or gamma up or down your viewer to make sure your highlights or shadows match your plate. You can preview different color spaces directly in your viewport to make sure your comp is looking correct in all of them, all while not affecting your final export. For noise and grain, we'll look at each channel individually and add accordingly. After just a 0.5 blur to take the edge off our perfect renders, we'll create an alpha based on the luminance, then remap that black and white value using a ramp piped through a color lookup, curves node for you Photoshop users, and then use that alpha to control the strength of the grain we're applying back over our render. Using R to see the red channel, we bring the noise in line with what's on our plate and then repeat that for green and blue. You could get even fancier and make this node tree per color channel and merge them all back again, but we ain't got time for that today. Lastly, a little bonus breakdown of some of the awesome advantage of a node-based workflow that lets you easily alter your render without having to go back to your 3D program. After all, your render should empower your comp artist to create the best version of the shot possible. This is a crypto mat. It's created at render time in your 3D program and gives us what can be called a clown pass or an ID pass. Basically, it assigns a random color to every object in your scene that then becomes an easily selectable quick mask and allows you to mask off as many or as few individual objects and use that subsequent mask to isolate any part of your render or any AOV breakout to tweak almost any aspect of your render rather specifically. Like here where we use it to select all the parts of the robot that were white, shift the white material to a more ominous black in the diffuse filter AOV, suck out the brass from the metal accents in the specular lighting AOV, and voila, an alternate version of our killer robot assassin without re-rendering a thing. <laughs> To try Nuke out for yourself. Nuke non commercial is free forever. It has limitations, so not good for big projects, but perfect to get in and start learning. So go to foundry.com and give it a shot. Link in the notes for that and everything else we talked about below as well. And if you haven't heard, my good friend and friend of the show, Seth Worley, is releasing his first feature film to theaters on August 6th. It's called Sketch, and it is big, fun, heartfelt, and genuinely a great movie that's really made for everyone. For the kids, it's an adventure film, and for the adults, it's a great comedy with a ton of heart. I've seen it a few times now, and I have no doubt that this is going to blow the doors open for Seth's career. If you want more original stories told by an artist, not a committee, go see this film and then see it again. But if you dug the episode, do us a solid and like, subscribe, and hit the bell to be notified when we put up more content. And until next time, don't forget to write, shoot, edit, repeat. Ooh.